and that God has big plans. Uh, <laughs> I went to go and to print my notes back at the hotel, and the computer there basically froze up on us and would not do it. And the people at the desk couldn't figure out, so I brought it to Gladys, and I said, Gladys, will you print my notes? And she plugged it in, and her computer completely froze. The mouse wouldn't work. She had to take the batteries out. She had to reboot the whole thing. And uh, at that point, I started praying over things. And <laughs> I said, Lord, please don't make me go cold turkey, which he's made me do before. I've, I've gone to walk into worship with my notes in my hand, and I've heard the Holy Spirit whisper in my ear, leave them on your desk. And I, I don't know if you've ever had to speak in front of a group of people, but when God tells you to leave your notes on your desk, that is a very um, interesting moment. <laughs> um, but God is always faithful, and the message is his. Amen? Amen. Amen? Well, I love your pastor and his wife. They are full of the Holy Ghost. And if you haven't hugged Isel yet tonight, she's got God all over her from her trip. He was walking up, I thought I was going to fall down on the pew. <laughs> And I don't know if you felt it, but when um, the praise team started to sing those first few words of awakening, oh my gosh, I just started crying. I could, I could feel the love of God for you. And it was big. It was really overwhelmingly big. I couldn't get through that whole first verse, so I couldn't even help you learn the song because I was overwhelmed with his love for, for each of you. And uh, I really counted a privilege to be here and and to, to open the Word of God together with you and, and to pray for awakening. <laughs> Anyone ever been sleepy out there in your spirit? Yeah. Feel like you're doing the same old, same old, you know? I love it when I'm on fire for God. And it's not all the time, you know? I, I think about how Paul told Timothy to fan the flame that was within him when they first laid hands on him and when he was called out to go. It, we have to be personally responsible for our flame. Amen? Amen. And sometimes it feels like that pilot light's just about to go out. I remember, though, when I was finishing up seminary at Asbury in Kentucky, I was driving home um, to see everybody back at, in Spring Hill, which was my home at the time. And as I was driving uh, to the Florida Georgia rest station, I decided to stop and use the restroom. Now, if you've ever made it through final exams, where are my students? It's a euphoric thing. <laughs> and when you know you have three weeks off, you just could, you know, spike something. You're just so excited. Well, I got into the bathroom at the rest station, and um, I was the only one in there. And I heard somebody come in and go into one of the stalls. And the next thing I heard was, so where are you heading? <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, Lord, you sent me a lonely person in the bathroom. <laughs> A little strange, a lot, but I'm just so full of your joy, I'll talk to her. And I said, I'm heading back to Florida to see my family. I've been away at school. It was quiet for a minute. And she said, how long will it take to get there? <laughs> and I said, well, depending how many more times I stop, probably about 12 or 13 hours. And it was quiet again. And she said, who will be there? I said, Mom and Dad and everybody at church and all my friends. And just then she said, hold on a minute. Some fool in the next stall keeps answering me. of young adults who were in college. 
And the Baptist students were really devout in the word, and they taught their friends the word, and they, they were like all about the word, you know. The Pentecostal students, they were all about worship and being in the spirit, and they were on fire for God. The Catholic students were very moral, and they followed the rules, and they lived upright lives. And the Methodist students, they were nice. <laughs> <laughs> the Methodist students were nice. And I, was, I was sitting up in, the, up in the balcony, and I went, what? <laughs> and I went home to my nieces, who were like 20, and I said, if you're nice, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Promise me you won't rest in the Lord. <laughs> you know what I mean. If you hear snoring next to you, give an elbow. Can we turn lights off, or is that like a major thing? <coughs> Take a look. It's called a thousand questions. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Shut the door. Keep out the devil. Jesus who died will be satisfied, and earth and heaven will be one. And did you notice when those, I've watched this video like dozens of times, and I cry every time when those church bells ring, when she says, I don't see it, I don't know it, where are you, or is you still away on high, what's your plan for this mess, for human captivity, for people stuck in slavery, who will come and set them free? Who will come and set us free? The church bells. You are the plan. I am the plan. We are the plan. And the big problem is there's an enemy who wants to keep us asleep. He wants us comfortable and fat with spiritual tryptophan. You know what tryptophan is? When you eat that turkey on Thanksgiving, Turkey has tryptophan in it. Have you heard that before? And they, they proved this last year. The bird has got the bad rap. <laughs> that is not really the turkey that's putting us to sleep, but it's the carbohydrate coma we're in from grandma's cornbread stuffing. And I want us to take some time tonight to talk about how is it that we can have Jesus and how we can have the Holy Spirit and still fall asleep as the church. So I invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 14. If you want to, it's okay if you just want to listen. That's okay too. Um, we're going to go to Gethsemane. We're going to go to Mark 14, 32, where Jesus goes to pray in the garden. I was really surprised when God led me here as one of our key passages for tonight. Um, but you know, <laughs> I think it's really appropriate. Because we're going to expose the big lie of, I'm not sleeping, I'm just resting my eyes. How many of you said that before? Anybody out there? My parents, they love that line. I'll say, Mom, we rented this you know, movie to watch. You're sleeping. I'm not sleeping. I'm just resting my eyes. I think if we're ever going to be the powerhouse that we need to be for human captivity, for Tallahassee to see revival, for John Wesley to see people healed and delivered and restored and families renewed and marriages healed and children delivered, uh, if we're going to see that, we have to have a moment of truth about where we're sleeping in our lives. So let's go to Mark 14, 32 where Jesus prays in Gethsemane. I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation. Then I went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here a while while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, now listen to this, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, if someone you love that you were super close to said, um, you know, Kay, I need you to pray for me. I am, I am so grieved and crushed to almost the point where I could just die. How serious would you take praying for me in that moment? Pretty serious. Pretty serious. Verse 35. 
He went on a little farther and fell to the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned, and what did he find? He found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch with me? Notice it doesn't say for me. Could you not watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body or the flesh is weak. weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before, verse 40. When he returned he to them again, he found them sleeping. For they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say. Verse 41, when he returned to them a third time, he said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But no, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let us be going. Look, my betrayer is here. How do you doze off when Jesus is facing death in his dire hour? How do you doze off? <laughs> and he even says it. He says it about himself and about, about them. The spirit is so willing, but our flesh is a whim. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Our flesh, you know, if you think about the practicality of that moment, they were probably out walking miles that day in the heat of the desert sun. They were probably physically exhausted. It was a long day. It was night. Their flesh was weary. I'll, I mean, I'll give them that. But you know, there is an enemy of our soul who is keyed into the statement that Jesus said at the end. Up, let's get going. My betrayer is here. Wake up, he says. Wake up, beloved. Wake up, church. The betrayer is near. And you know, we, we um, don't recognize how strategic the enemy still is. You know, he doesn't fight in so many of the obvious ways. You know, um, sometimes he puts us to sleep in subtle ways that we would easily, easily miss. I want to tell you a little bit of story to, um, to illustrate my point. I'm, I'm not married and I don't have children, but I am an aunt and I love being Aunt Beba. My kids call me Aunt Beba because before they could say Debbie, they said Beba. Even one of them said it before mommy, which was like my crowning glory. <laughs> I was like, thank you, Jesus. You know, <laughs> I love it. So anyway, my nieces are now 20, and they came down last spring for a special visit with me. So I decided to go with them and my sister to Orlando. And we thought, well, let's spend the night in a hotel so we can, we do tea at downtown Disney, and then we were going to go see a good Christian comedy club over there. And it was going to be late, so she booked us a room at the Radisson. She goes, guess what? They have sleep number beds. Now, do any of you have a sleep number bed? I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> okay. So she said, we can, uh, their motto is dial your own comfort. I thought, that sounds really good after a long day in Orlando. So we get to the hotel, we get in our beds, and um, I was sleeping with my niece, niece Rachel, who weighs probably about 110 pounds. <laughs> Little foreshadowing for you here. <laughs> and my sister slept with my other niece. About one in the morning, I woke up and I thought, am I on the floor? And I reached my hand, just slightly over the side, and the carpet was there, okay? <laughs> I, <laughs> I turned to see if Rachel was okay, and she was three feet above me. <laughs> For those of you trying to figure it out, I had displaced all of the air in the bed because our weight was so different, and she <laughs>
the plumbing to her dad, you know. So we fixed the bed, but I could not get past the whole thing. So we'd fall asleep a little, and then the songs started. I was sinking deep in sin. Love lifted me. Love is lifting me higher. My favorite was, you raise me up. I'm telling you, I don't know how I did not kick us out of the hotel because I was screaming laughing. I was laughing like a Pentecostal. I was just out of control. And I went home and, and I had a, I had to prepare to speak someplace. And all I could think of was the sleep number bed story. And I'm like, Lord, you need to help me focus here because I have to speak to this group of people. And God showed me that this is the plan of the enemy, not to use the sleep number bed, but that whole motto of die of your own comfort to look at what makes you comfortable, to feed your flesh, to turn the channel when the starving child comes on. I've done it. I know you have too. To, to just be comfortable. Our country, our nation says, be comfortable. You've worked hard in your life. You deserve to be comfortable. I don't remember reading anything in here. <laughs> about being comfortable. In fact, Paul said, I learned how to be comfortable with nothing. I learned how to be content with much or little. And I read in Revelation 3 where God talks about the comfortable church. You might know it as the lukewarm church. He, he likens that to vomit. <laughs> I know that's not good, is it, Kay? I mean, we don't want to be spewed out of the mouth of God. But what happened to the disciples that night with Jesus is still happening today. And it's happened in my life, and it's happening in yours, where the enemy says, here, sheepy, sheepy, sheepy. And he has lots of things to feed us just to get us okay enough so we don't seek more. Just to keep us complacent enough that we're nice. Those Methodists, they're nice. I told those my nieces, I said, be nice, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I, I want to be dangerous for God, because you know what? When you watch those images, like we watch, people are suffering. And we don't have to go outside of our country, although really we don't know suffering like a lot of people know suffering in the world. And the whole while, the enemy is looking for ways to feed our flesh. And you know what? It's not only things like um, maybe success or, or being really important at our church. He might feed us with those things. But it's busyness, too. That's my nemesis. Anyone else? Just so busy. Listen to Romans 13 in the message. But make sure you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day -day obligations that you lose track of time and doze off, oblivious to God, the night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. We must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence and sleeping around in dissipation and bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourself in Christ and be up and about. Even then, Paul knew we were prone to be sheep who sleep. <laughs> you know, sheepy, sheepy. Nobody wants to admit that there's parts of our spiritual life that are dozing. That's why I chose the title. We want to just say we're just resting a little bit. I liken this to, to the enemy feeding us what I call spiritual snicker bars. Does anyone remember the motto of Snickers? Snickers really satisfies. Good job. Snickers really satisfies. And I think the enemy walks around with his little spiritual snicker bars. And he says, come on, be satisfied with your success. You have a PhD, Pastor Armando. Be satisfied. You've made something with your life. Here, have a snicker bar. You know? 
You're a leader in your church, Linda. I saw Linda earlier somewhere. You know, you're a leader. You're, you're, you're full of religion and all the things that you do for God. It's enough, honey. You do enough. Here, have a snicker bar. You know, Nancy, your life is comfortable. You know, you have your house, your three dogs. You know, you're involved in your church. You're good to go, honey. Have a snickers bar. Debbie, you've got a couple college degrees. And the rest of us, we can go on and on. Live in your routine. Your life is safe that way. Don't take any risks. You've done your time. Here, honey, have a Snickers bar. I know about those Snickers bars. <laughs> More ways than one. Um, but I know about them because I was all about spiritual Snicker bars. I was abused as a child. Um, I have two lovely parents. The best parents a child could ever ask for. But there was alcoholism in my household, and it had run through generations in our household, and it was a hard place to be. And, and my brother, who was my abuser, um, was looking for someone to control, and I was seven years his younger, and I was the perfect target. And um, that sort of abuse really, really wounds you to the core. And so as an adult, I learned to be busy, so I didn't have to deal with the ghosts in my closet, spinning, spinning, spinning. Because if you slow down, those memories don't come back on you. I learned how to be successful. Teacher, youngest teacher of the year in Hernando County. I didn't go into pastoring, even though I was called since the age of five, because God couldn't use me because I was too broken. But as a teacher, I was super successful. I was a leader in my church. I was successful at everything I touched, because I had to be perfect, or I might get hurt again. I had to hide my insecurities so no one knew I cried myself to sleep every night. I had to be used of God because then I could mask my feelings of shame and unworthiness. Snicker bars, snicker bars, snicker bars. And I was miserable. Miserable. And one day, God's Spirit leaned into my ear and said, Debbie, honey, there's more. There's more. There's more than the lie that you're living. It's time to wake up. And he used it when, on a day that I tried to take my own life. I got in my car, I was driving home from Lakeland, and I had had it. And I decided I, was, I knew the one turn that would be too hard to take at 80 miles an hour. And so I decided to floor it. I, I was the youth director at our church. I was a student at Florida Southern. And um, I decided my life wasn't worth living. And so when I got up to that curb, I gunned it. I pushed the pedal all the way to the floor. And as I went to take the curb, I got the Charlie horse of the century in the back of my driving leg. And I had to pull my foot off the gas. And I pulled it up, you know, that knot you get in the back of your cab. And my car slowed down just enough so that when I rounded the corner and the stalled out Porsche trailer that was in the middle of the road was in front of me, I was able to pull off I landed up in the ditch on the side of the road. I did not flip my car. I did not scratch a bit of me. And the whole time, I had, and I was telling you how long ago this was, I had a tape in the cassette player, and it was blaring, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And I'm pushing the button, trying to get that thing out of there before I got up to the curb, and it wouldn't come out, so I just left it. And as my car came to a stop, that thing ejected right out of the tape cassette. And a man came running up to the side of my car. I said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. And then I said, but I will be. And I went home and I told somebody everything about the ways I was trying to hide my pain and hide um, all the shame and the secrets. I finally let the truth be known about my life. I tried to stop dialing my own comfort and pretending like it didn't matter. And God saved my life. And every time I get to be somewhere and share with a group of people, especially people who've been through abuse, the Lord steals back from the enemy what he stole from me. And I feel resurrection. You know, there are so many people who are just like me, who are in your community, 
who need to be able to come here and be awake and have someone say, it's time to come out of your slumber. And if we're slumbering too, we can't invite them out. We can't ask them, be awakened. No, Jesus. How are you dialing your own comfort in your life right now? I always start melting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. How are you dialing your own comfort right now? Are you the person who's too busy and who is um, spinning, 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 so that your busyness keeps you from being fully awakened? Are you the person who's um, just really together? You're doing all the right things, but you still feel that emptiness at the end of the day. There's more. Tomorrow night when we're together, we're going to lay a lot of things down at the altar and really empty out the things that weigh us down. And Saturday, we're going to ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ask for a filling again. Did you know you leak? You do. When you go and you spill out on other people, you need a refill. <laughs> you know, yes, we get God's spirit when we say yes to him. But there's more, and he wants to give you more. But the place we have to start at is, I'm not fully awake right now. How are you trying to stay in control and convince yourself that you're okay? So where are you heading? <laughs> so funny since I've told that cell phone story. I can't go anywhere and use the bathroom because someone will spot me going in and I'll be in the stall and my hair is so weird. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all are uh, crazy off the hook. But it's okay to let the Lord meet you at the place where you're slumbering. He knows our spirit's willing, but our flesh is weak. And I feel like this weekend he's saying, will you come and watch and pray with me? Just give me the time. Just give me the time, and I'll show you what it means to live fully awake. Our little church in Ridge Manor, when I went there, we had 12 people, and we were really at a place where closing was a very big option. And I had watched that incredible group of people trust God to awaken them to a whole new beginning. And we're just completely a different a different family, completely, radically changed. Our children led Pentecost Sunday. And I'm telling you, the adults are still brimming with God's spirit from being led by those babies. And they led every part of the service. The little guys, the guys from elementary school, they were so full of the love of God. And I thought, when I first came here, there wasn't a person under 65. But they were longing for the children, and they just didn't know how to be awakened. And they were so hungry to be the answer with the church bells. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me. You have a pastor and a pastor's wife who are full of God's spirit who will lead you into places that you never dreamed or imagined you could go personally or this church could go corporately. But it's time to lay down the snicker bars. It's time to lay down the things that have taken the edge off so that we're not looking for more, when we're not looking to be satisfied with God's Spirit. So I just want to lead us in a time of prayer right now as we get ready to close. And um, Miss Martha, will you pray and play quietly? Yeah, oh, both of you, that'd be lovely. <laughs> and as you feel led, if you want to come and have prayer, you can be at your seat if those knees just can't do the rail. But I just invite you to just um, have some moments of being in the Lord's presence. And uh, I'll leave this. Let's pray. Gracious God, we just love you so much. And Lord, we admit that there's, there's so many areas of our lives where we've just gotten comfortable. Gotten comfortable with the way that we live and we can control our lives, they're manageable, they're really nice, Lord. But Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move in our hearts tonight, that we need more of you, we need all of you, and you won't wrestle us for those things that we've used 
to make us feel satisfied. Father, I pray that you would break away the spirit of fear on those who are afraid to lose control in their lives, afraid to let you fully lead. Lord, um, just ask that you would be close to those who have been hurt, where their trust has been broken by others, people whose parents maybe weren't able to love them, and it was hard from an early age to learn how to be close to somebody. Lord, you're the healer of everything broken. And you know the places of our lives that need your touch tonight. I thank you for this church. Your love for them is so huge. It's so immense. And you just want to be close. Lord, you showed me when I was here in April and visiting how you want to so fill this people with your spirit that even as people drive by on Augustine, they would be even healed as they drove by. But that requires us to be um, a Pentecost church, Lord, where you come in your dunamis power, your dynamite power fills us. Lord, as we just take a few moments in the quiet of the altar, I pray for the one who may not be sure that they have you. You're not sure um, about having Jesus in your heart. Just invite you to welcome him in tonight. And you just tell him in the quiet of your heart, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I need you. I can't do this on my own. I need your spirit within me. I need you within me. Wash me and cleanse me. Fill me and use me. Just yield myself to you. Jesus, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I know many of these people have been walking with you for years. We ask for new dreams and new visions. New fire. And Lord, for some reason, there's just a really quiet spirit here tonight. Reminds me of Zephaniah 317, where you tell us that you'll exult over us with singing, and you'll quiet us with your love. Holy Spirit, just come and minister to your people. Minister to your we ask that you would draw people here in the next few minutes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We trust you. We trust you.